Well, good evening. Welcome to the second in this series of conversations about creation care sponsored by sure. the Creation Care Task Force at St. Timothy's Church. I'm Bill, Schle Bill Shreve, the leader of the Creation Care Task Force, and I hope all of you are safe and well. I know all, everyone here in the Bay Area has been impacted by the fires started by severe lightning storm 11 days ago. I was uh, in an evacuation warning zone, so my car is all packed up and ready to go still. The good weather yesterday helped uh, the firemen control the spread, and now our warning has been lifted, but many others have not. I'm sure many of you have similar stories, and all of you are suffering from the smoke and the degradation of our air quality. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Our speaker is uh, Dr. Christina Perez from Galveston, and she has a similar story. She's in an evacuation zone for Hurricane Laura and probably will not be able to call in tonight. Despite this, she sent us a video presentation for you to see. I'm really impressed that she took the time to provide this to us when she herself was facing packing all her valuables and leaving her home. Yeah. I just, having just done that myself, I know I took three days of basically worrying about it, nothing else. She did this for us in a very limited amount of time. Our prayers go out to Christina and all those impacted by the fires and Hurricane Laura. In the fires here in California and the severe hurricane Laura in the Gulf, we're seeing the effects of climate change related to human activity that increases greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. As we heard in the first of our creation care presentations, the scientific community first predicted atmospheric warning from the greenhouse effect in 1860. It's not like we didn't have any warning. The first presidential warning from the green, uh, that global warming was a threat to our national security was delivered to Lyndon Johnson over 50 years ago. Now the DOD is ca calling climate change a threat multiplier in many areas. We see this as the increased severity of storms, like the unprecedented lightning storm 11 days ago, and the intensification of hurricanes, like Hurricane Laura. The impacts of these events is much greater on the poor than it is on those of us with the resources to adapt. The poor are also the people who have done the least to contribute to this problem. Climate migration of the poor has begun and will grow to massive proportions in the near future, as reported in the New York Times Magazine last month. We can no longer ignore climate change and our contribution to it. That's why we're hosting this series. Most activists say that the first thing we need to do is talk more about climate change. At a conference I attended uh, last week, Catherine Hayhoe gave us suggestions on how to talk about climate change and get people's attention. She pointed out that just talking about the science has not worked and will not work. We've got to talk about how climate change is impacting us. Jim Antal in his book, Climate Church, Climate World, makes the point that it's not a political problem or a technology problem, it's a moral problem. And therefore, we will have many more crises like these, like the fires. And as Christians, we can contribute to, the, to a plan for reducing the severity and infrequency by attacking climate change. We have the technology, we, have, we, um, we just lack the will to make the changes. We can't afford to wait for a better time. So in this series, we hope to start conversations about climate change and creation care that spur people to action. We believe that faith groups are well positioned to lead the movement to harmonize our lifestyles with sustaining creation. We can do this working as individuals, as communities, as a nation, and as an international leader. Our series of conversations focuses first on how we can start this work with our individual actions. Faith is the key and God will work wondrous ways through people of faith. We just have to become part of God's plan. So please join me in prayer. Hmm. Almighty God, in giving us dominion over things on earth, you made us fellow workers in your creation. Give us wisdom and reverence, so to use the resources of nature that no one may suffer from our abuse of them, and that generations yet to come may continue to praise you for your bounty through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Amen. Amen. Jenny, would you like to introduce the speaker and, uh, and her video? Okay. I'm excited to share with you guys tonight about adopting a zero waste lifestyle. It's one of the fastest, most cost effective short term actions you can do to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, by 2030, zero waste strategies could actually reduce greenhouse gas emissions by more than 400 million metric tons of CO2 per year. And that's the equivalent of taking over 20% of the US coal fired power plants off the grid. Wow. Um, it means that this, these strategies can actually do more than expanding nuclear power right now or improving vehicle efficiency or carbon capture projects. Um, it's, it's really something that, that can get going right now, today. We don't need any science to do it. We just need the willpower. But what does a, a living a zero waste act, uh, life actually look like? Tonight, we're going to hear via video uh, from Dr. Christina Perez, a former professor of biology, biological scientist an environmental health researcher. She'll de demystify the process by sharing her own best practices, products, recipes, tools, and techniques. And yes, I will be loading up her recipes at the end. She has recipes for a lot of things I would never think of. But before we hear from Dr. Prez, I just want to touch on a definition and zero waste at home pioneer B. Johnson. Zero waste refers to the conservation of all resources by means of responsible production, consumption, reuse, recovery of products, packaging materials without burning, and no discharge to land, water, or air that threaten the environment or human health. Um, how do we accomplish this goal? Well, organizations everywhere, such as at Stanford University, where I pulled this definition, they're analyzing this impact, their impact. Um, and even at the state level, um, uh, where I had the opportunity to help lobby for AB 1080 and, and Senate Bill 54, um, it, it w at the state level, they're looking at requiring all packaging, all packaging to be recyclable or compostable by 2032. And that's creating a circular economy. What they produce is ultimately going to be used by them. And the intent of this legislation is to achieve a 75% reduction of waste generated by single-use packaging. That's great. Well, we hope it passes. Um, it's on the floor right now. But what can we do ourselves at home starting today? Well, in 2013, B. Johnson launched her book, The Zero Waste Home. Uh, it's an inspirational story that tells how she transformed her life and that of her family for the better by reducing their waste to one liter, yeah, one single mason jar of waste per year. So how does she do this feat? Um, we're going to watch a short video to find out. To me, the zero waste lifestyle is not about complicating your life, it's about simplifying it. I think people have a tendency to picture me as a stay-at-home mom that spends her day doing zero waste. <laughs> it's not true at all. Uh, I mean, I have a full-time job, and uh, if it wasn't for zero waste, I probably you know, would have a super hectic schedule. Uh, but zero waste has simplified my life to really make uh, what matters most of uh, focus in our lives. My husband quit his job to start a sustainability consulting company and I tackled the home. <laughs> I started bringing grocery totes to the store instead of using the plastic bags. Then I started bringing uh, my own cloth bags, which I made from old sheets to buy in bulk. Thank you. I'm gonna, if you could fill it, that'd be great. And then I thought, well, I can probably push it further and bring jars to the counters to eliminate the cheese, meat, fish wrapper. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. When 
I first decided to bring a, a glass jar to the counter, they looked at me and they said, you know, why are you doing this? So why, why do you want to put it in here? And I said, oh, I don't have a trash can. They're like, oh, okay. Then they put it in. I found that it was the easiest way. Instead of going into long, you know, long speech about what I do and why I do it. Oh, that sounds great, actually. I found also that this way of uh, uh, shopping is a more human way of shopping because it, it forces you in a way to have a, a contact with the person behind the counter. Do you have a nice weekend? Yeah, not too bad. How about you? I have to speak to the person behind the counter. It's uh, we know each other, we have a conversation. Uh, it, it gives a better sense of community because you care more about them and they care more about you. I usually have. Thank you. And instead of going in the middle aisles, I only do the perimeter of the store. And the perimeter of the store is also uh, what's healthier for you. I'm actually looking for the fruit without the stickers. But it's really hard to find. <laughs> That's where you're going to have the uh, unprocessed foods that, are, that don't have packaging. I used to buy lots of different products because I was listening to marketers that told me that for each application, we need a different product. To clean the floor, we need a product. To clean the mirrors, we need a different product. To clean the bathrooms, a different product. The uh, kitchen, a different product. And in the end, I had, you know, a cupboard full of cleaning products, which actually were even toxic for me. Once I started this lifestyle, I really questioned my need for all these products. And eventually, I found that I didn't need any of them. So to achieve zero waste at home, we simply follow five rules in order. Uh, so one, we refuse what we do not need. Two, we reduce what we do need. Three, we reuse by swapping anything that's disposable for a reusable alternative and buying secondhand. Uh, four, we recycle only what we cannot refuse, reduce, or reuse. And fourth, we rot uh, that is compost the rest. So these are all the things we need as far as hygiene and cosmetics. On the cheeks, I use a cocoa powder straight from uh, the bulk bin. And to fill this jar, it costs me 72 cents and it's organic powder. And then I make my own mascara with just four ingredients. It was back in 2010 that I watched my husband take the trash can down to the curb with like almost nothing in it. And then I, uh, I, I told him, well, how about we keep our waste so then we'll see how much waste we generate in a year. Uh, so we started throwing it in a, in a glass jar. And, uh, and so today we found that we only generate, uh, you know, a quart size uh, of waste per year. So this is uh, the waste that my uh, family of four collected in 2014. There's a passport cover also in there, uh, fruit stickers, old caulking that we had to remove from behind the sink. My husband was actually not truly on board at first. Because he said, you know, we're just one little household. If we do zero waste at home, it's not going to change anything. Uh, I think I've been able to prove him wrong. Uh, thanks to the book and the blog, I've inspired thousands of people to adopt the zero waste lifestyle throughout the world. Um, but also, my husband was not really convinced at first because he was afraid that this lifestyle was costing us too much. Um, so I urged him to compare our bank statements before, uh, between our pre-zero uh, waste lifestyle with the zero waste lifestyle. And that's where he found that we were saving 40% on our overall spending. This is due to the fact that we consume way, way less than we did before. My kids consider that zero waste is my job. And in a way, they're, they're right because I am the consumer for the household. I'm the one that makes uh, those decisions. I'm the one that buys for the household. And uh, zero waste is actually more what we do outside the home than what we do inside our home. 
a lot of people have a tendency to think, oh, it sounds complicated. It is at first because you have to figure out a system that works for you. You have to figure out where the bulk locations are. And it takes time also to declutter your life and adopt, you know, a voluntary simplicity. You have to go through every drawer, everything you have. This is my husband's column and the top and this mine right there. It's important to say that when you have things that you don't need, you're holding them from other people. You're keeping them from being useful to other people. When I started uh, my blog, I would have never, I mean, in a million years, could have imagined uh, launching a movement that would be adopted throughout the world. Uh, today, the book and the blog have inspired thousands of people, thousands of families throughout the world to adopt this lifestyle. Some entrepreneurs have taken it further uh, through their jobs. They've opened uh, zero waste stores. Every day, it seems like I get an email from some entrepreneur somewhere in the world telling me that uh, they've been inspired to open a zero waste store and I think it's, it's just amazing and it's fantastic. Quickly, what it is she mentioned. Um, the first thing we talked about is refusing, learning to say no to things you don't need. And I've heard people take it as far as gifting. If somebody's going to gift you, you can tell people you're involved in a zero life, life um, lifestyle challenge and say, I'd really prefer that I didn't receive anything with packaging or that it has a use or that it's edible or something like that. Um, reducing, donating, or selling, letting go of things that are no longer of use. I don't know if you in Mountain View are aware, there is actually a tool lending library in the Mountain View library. You don't even need to own a tool, you can go borrow one. Um, and that's uh, something that other cities could model. You reuse, switch from disposable items to permanent or alternative, recycle, sort your waste correctly, um, which is very difficult to do now because a lot of things are going on recently um, in the plastics in particular. And rot compost your own household waste or take part in a composting program for organic waste. Um, so that's what she touches on. And our speaker, it was going to be very interactive today. Um, she was going to be sharing a lot. We were going to have questions and answers. So pardon us for pivoting. She's a little bit, um, she did a wonderful job pulling this together for us. And I'd still, she, she really wanted to share it with you. Dr. Christina Perez, um, her, her bio is she became passionate about environmental health as an undergraduate student. And after graduating, she began researching environmental impacts of air pollutants on cardiac health received her PhD in toxicology from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Um, and she's worked as an assistant professor of biological sciences for five years um, and is committed to implementing practical solutions to climate change in her own life. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak with you today. My name is Dr. Christina Perez. I'm honored to be with you and I want to say how encouraged I am that different faith groups are coming together to talk about combating climate change. Now, sometimes climate change can feel very overwhelming and certainly there are some big picture items such as demanding more subsidies for solar and wind power as well as protection of open space that we can all become advocates for. But today I'm going to talk about something much more closer, much closer to home, something that an individual can utilize to help fight climate change and that's waste reduction. The average American produces about four and a half pounds of trash per day. This equals 250 million tons of trash going to landfills each year from the United States. Now, this trash that goes to landfills produces a very high volume of methane gas, which is a potent greenhouse gas about 30 times more effective than carbon dioxide at trapping heat energy. So by reducing waste and reducing things that we send to the landfill, we as individuals can help combat climate change and in a very significant way. Methane gas in landfills contributes to 15% of human related methane emissions. And so reducing that methane production is a really, really wonderful way to help combat climate change in our own lives. So is your waste lifestyle is exactly what it sounds like. It is reducing waste in every part of our lives. 
Now, I'm going to take you on a tour of my home today where we're going to look at some different parts of the home where we can reduce waste. Along the way, I'm going to be asking you questions for you to think about for your own life and also extrapolate that to your larger congregation to see how your different congregation functions and if maybe there are some ways that you can reduce waste within that group. So let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to turn the phone around and we're going to walk through the house and start in the kitchen. The kitchen is one of the first places that I decided to tackle the waste in my life. I'm going to come to the pantry first and we'll open the pantry. And when we open the pantry, you'll see that all you see inside these pantry are glass jars. Lots of glass jars lining all the various sides of the pantry. So one thing I noticed in my life when I did a zero waste inventory is that most of my waste came from buying packaged foods in the grocery store. So what I did was I invested in jars. You can find them for very excellent prices on the internet. Glass jars are sold in all major stores as well. And so they're very easy to get a hold of. The excellent thing about glass is it's inert and it will last forever as long as it does not break. So it makes it a really, really excellent vehicle to hold foods. So what I do is when I go to the grocery store, I take my reusable bags right here, and then I bring with me some cotton and linen bags, and I'll show you them right here. Here's a little cotton bag. You can see it has a little drawstring. It's just a little bag right here, and I have them in linen as well, a tighter knit linen weave. And what I do is when I go to the grocery store, I buy from the bulk section. You often see these sections in different Whole Foods or different co-op grocery stores. And I put the items into my small bag here. I'll put them, I'll put the food into the small bag and then I bring this bag home and I dump it into one of my glass jars. That way, when I go to the grocery store, I do not bring any packaging home. And so this has been a really, really fabulous way to reduce waste. Now, this extrapolates to the bigger question of food. So I want you to ask yourself as you do this, would you be able to implement this in your own life? Maybe getting some small bags or maybe some old pillowcases, old dish towels and making them into bags and getting some food from the bulk section of the grocery store? On a larger question, does your congregation have a midweek meal? Or does it have a Saturday or Sunday fellowship service where you share a meal together? Do you prepare the food in house in a kitchen or do you get takeout food that produces waste? Are there ways that you can reduce the amount of waste coming into your congregation that involves food. That's something to think about in your breakout session after this video. Let's go ahead and move in further into the kitchen and talk about some other ways to reduce waste. And one of those is with paper towels. So paper towels was definitely the second most wasteful item that I found when I was doing my zero waste inventory. And so what I did was I got rid of all paper towels and I just used cotton dish towels to clean things. And so there's no need for a paper towel. You can use a dish towel to wipe anything up on your countertop. That is not a problem. Also paper napkins fall into the paper category. So you see here I have many different cloth napkins all different sizes and fabrics that I utilize now. So we do not use any more paper products at all in the home. You will be amazed at how much waste can be reduced when you get rid of paper towels. Now, the other area that I noticed in my own life that produced waste in the kitchen was using things like plastic wrap to help contain food when it went back in the refrigerator. And so here below, you can see what I've done over time to eliminate all plastics from our food from our food life. And so here you see a lot of different strategies to help reduce plastics. The first one is the most common and many of you already likely have, which is the reusable water bottle. I have one here in glass and I have an insulated one here in stainless steel. 
Now, the important thing with the reusable water bottle is to get one that you love because they last forever. You can imagine that putting a stainless steel bottle in the landfill, it will never break down. So it's good to have one that you really love that you can just take everywhere with you because you're going to have it forever. The other thing I have now instead of plastic wrap are silicone lids. These little lids go on top of bowls to help keep food preserved in the refrigerator. Now I get these often as gifts. You can see that's why I have so many. Once you tell people that you're interested in zero waste, they find really wonderful creative gifts to give you, which is fantastic. You do not need to buy any of these things. You can simply put a plate over a bowl as well. So this is not something where you need to invest money in. You can really do it in a makeshift way over time, and you'll wind up saving yourself quite a bit of money over time as well because you will wind up stop, not purchasing any, uh, you will not purchase any packaged foods eventually, and that's really excellent both for the environment and for your own health. Some other things we see in this drawer, I have some beeswax wrap, very popular. This is another big gift item that people send to me. That is a great one to utilize because it can be composted after it's done. I also have a lot of glass Tupperware containers with lids on them, and this is what I use to store food. What I also do is I have a kit that I take with me whenever I travel to a restaurant. So anytime I go to a restaurant, I bring a stainless steel container and I bring this little device right here. When you open it up, you can see that it has a fork and a knife. It has some chopsticks and a stirring rod and a napkin. I bring this with me everywhere I go so that if I go to a restaurant or if I'm eating somewhere where there's only plastic silverware or paper napkins available, I can just bring my own silverware and own plastic wrap. And so that is a really great, great way to reduce waste. And then if there are any leftovers, any leftover food, I can simply put it in my container and take it home. So there's no need to take a styrofoam container home um, when, after going to a restaurant. So you can feel free to do all of the normal things that you do, but you can just be creative and think of some zero waste ways to do that. Now, of course, now I want to ask you in terms of your congregations and involving thinking of reducing paper and plastic waste, how do you set up your Sunday worship services? Do you have a paper bulletin that you utilize? Could you possibly think of projecting the order of service, maybe onto a PowerPoint presentation, or maybe getting a code that an iPhone could scan that would allow people to follow the service without having to utilize a lot of paper waste in the creation of bulletins? So that's something to think about in your breakout session that you can talk about with each other. Continue on in the kitchen. I'm going to come over to the sink area and show you. For my dish soap, I use Castile soap just in a glass container. And for my sponges, I use a loofah gourd. This is a gourd that is grown in the garden. And then in the late fall, the fibrous part of the plant remains and the fleshy part of the plant dries out and it makes a wonderful sponge. You can find these at various health food stores and at the farmer's market, or you can grow your own. Here's the end of the piece of that gourd right here. and so. So they're very fun to grow, very easy to grow. You can get, um, you can order the seeds online, um, or again, you can find these in farmer's markets. So underneath the sink, you'll see that I have two buckets. I have a big Home Depot bucket, which is where I put all of my vegetable scrap waste. And then when that bucket gets full, I take it outside to my compost bin. And then I do have a trash can because even with a zero waste life, Style, sometimes you'll find that you'll produce a small amount of trash. And so I do have that trash can and I monitor the amount of trash that goes in and out. Now, sometimes we have materials that need to be recycled. And so we will take those recyclable materials and we will, of course, recycle them. Now, it is important to note that the zero waste lifestyle is not necessary. It's not a recycling lifestyle. So it's about reducing waste, period. So trying to get rid of all of waste. Now, recycling is much better than sending things to the landfill, but it's important to realize that not all materials are thought of equally in the recycling center. And in a time now where we have very low oil prices, 
a lot of times the plastic that gets sent to a recycling center will actually just be taken to the landfill because it's not fi there's no financial incentive to recycle that plastic when oil prices are so low. So these are things to keep in mind that recycling is not the end all be all. The best thing to do is to get rid of the waste period. So these are, again, this is the, the kitchen items. So these are the major ways that I've reduced waste in the kitchen. You can see always using regular plates as well. So not using, utilizing any plastic and then just keeping all the utensils organized in the drawer and using some nice cotton, you know, holders that you can use forever. And then you'll have all your supplies here ready to use. And these will be in service for a very long time. So now that we've seen the kitchen and how waste can be reduced there, let's go into the laundry room and talk a little bit about cleaning. So we're in the laundry room here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring down my cleaning basket and I'll show you what I have inside. So the first thing I have is this stainless steel water bottle, and that is full of a solution of one part vinegar and two parts water. That's one part distilled white vinegar and two parts water. This is the solution that I utilize for cleaning in the home. I use it to clean everything. I use it to clean all my surfaces. I use, I spray it inside the toilet to scrub the toilet. I spray it in the shower to clean the shower. I use it on absolutely everything. It's a very effective cleaner and it is very easy to whip up and also extremely affordable. There is no need to have a hundred different cleaners in plastic bottles. You can utilize this vinegar water solution in a stainless steel bottle or just utilize an old plastic bottle that is empty and that will serve you very well for all your cleaning needs. In addition to that, I have a collection of microfiber pads. These are the pads that I use to wipe down surfaces after I've sprayed it with the vinegar. So this is instead of paper towels. I have had these for over 10 years and they look great. They still hold up very well. Now for mopping the floor, instead of using a Swiffer, I use this pad. This actually is a bone up pad and that's a company that does hardwood floor cleaners. I just like their pad a lot. So I take the pad and I stick it on the bottom of the mop here. You can see it here in action. And this is what I use to clean all of the floors so that there's no, uh, no piece of the plastic or that paper to throw away after you've mopped the floor. And then this can just go into the washing machine when you're done. Now for washing, there's another strategy to help reduce waste and there's those, that is dryer balls. You see my three dryer balls here, they're made of sheep's wool. These are used in place of dryer sheets. So they help push the clothing apart from each other, and reduce static. And the nice thing about them is you can take an essential oil and drop about two drops on each of the balls and your clothing will still smell absolutely wonderful when it comes out of the dryer. So there's no need to lose that nice fresh scent, but you can eliminate all that plastic waste coming from your dryer sheets. So that's a, a really good way um, to think about uh, cleaning in terms of converting maybe to a more sustainable, more zero waste process in cleaning your home and in cleaning your congregation. So big picture question for you. You can think on an individual level, how do I clean my home? How many products do I currently use? And can I pare it down to a simple waste-free process? And then thinking about your congregations, what chemicals do you currently use in your congregations? Do you have paper towels in the restroom? Could you think about converting that to air dryers so that you do not produce paper towel waste in the restrooms? These are things that I'd like you to think about in your breakout session. So I'm going to put the cleaning basket back and I'm going to go to our final spot in the house to talk about waste reduction and that is the restroom. So I'm going to come into this under sink area in the restroom and pull out all of my personal bathroom supplies so we can go through them. I'm not going to spend as much time on this and you will have a list of all of these ingredients to try out on your own, but I do like to make you aware of some of the wonderful opportunities of a zero waste lifestyle. So here you see all of my personal beauty products. I have small glass jars that contain both a face lotion 
a baking soda tea tree oil toothpaste. We have here a natural baking soda arrowroot deodorant. And here we have a Castile soap and coconut mixture for a face wash. I then have a bamboo toothbrush that I can compost when it has been used for its lifetime. I have a small comb that I've had for many years. That's what I use for my hair. I have a small perfume case that where the perfume part in the middle wears down and then it can be refilled. So it makes it nice waste a free process. And then I have makeup that I make on my own if you do wear makeup. It's very easy to make your own makeup powders and you can really go for it too. There are some great recipes out there to make your own mascara, to make your own blush as well. So all of these things are comprise my beauty regime. And then I have my airplane safe bag where I can just throw them all in this bag. And it's very, it makes it very easy to travel, very easy to move about. Here I have a, an infused calendula oil, which I use for all of my body moisturizing needs. And so this is just a great thing to think about when you're thinking about your own life is, is it possible for me to reduce my, my consumption of beauty products and of things that I put on my body? Maybe I can make some of those at home. Maybe I can use some reusable containers when I make them myself. Along that same line, I'm gonna open the shower and you see what I use, utilize as a bar of soap. And then I have two stainless steel containers with a pop top lid. These contain my shampoo and conditioner. So I use a coconut milk Castile soap shampoo and then an apple cider vinegar rinse. And I make those from home and put them in my container. So there's no need to buy plastic bottles of shampoo and conditioner. So that's just to show you that you can really take the zero waste lifestyle to any level that you want and it can be a lot of fun. I really encourage you to look at sites on the internet, um, different publications such as Willow and Sage that can teach you how to make some of your own bath and beauty products and as well as cleaning products for the home. It's a, it's a really fun process. It also makes a great gift and it makes a great way to live a more sustainable life and to keep trash out of the landfill and reduce climate change on an individual level. Such a wonderful thing to have something that we can do as individuals. Now for the final part of our meeting together, I'm going to go outside and talk about a little bit bigger picture of sustainability. So you can see my dog there. He's an important part of my zero waste lifestyle by eating any leftover food that we may have. I'm going to bring you out here and just talk a little bit about thinking bigger picture. So I live in a suburban neighborhood and I have a classic postage postage stamp lawn, which I have converted into a combination of vegetable garden and native pollinator garden. So I'll bring you up so you can maybe see some of the bees at work here. But I've worked for the past three years to convert this space to be a more sustainable space where I can grow some of my own food, but also have a place for native pollinating insects to thrive. And so I want you to think about maybe your own home or your congregation. Do you have a space that is currently grass that you could convert to a native pollinator garden or maybe a vegetable plot? Something to think about in terms of larger sustainability. The final part of sustainability that I've also focused on are my chickens. Here you see Victoria and Elizabeth. I'll give them some little, some worms so you can see them eat. This has been a wonderful way to increase sustainability in my life by providing me with eggs. And also the chickens provide me with all the fertilizer that I need for my vegetable garden. So something to think of, maybe something that if you've been thinking about doing it in your own home, I really do encourage you um, to get those chickens. They are absolutely fabulous. They're wonderful, wonderful companions to have in your life for so many reasons. Now, for this final kind of part of, the, of our discussion, I want you to think a little bit bigger picture in terms of your congregations, in terms of how you organize your stewardship campaigns. So this is gonna be another breakout question for you. How do you currently organize those stewardship campaigns? Do you mail out envelopes to members of your congregation? Could you maybe think of a way where you could transition to doing direct deposit for stewardship campaigns? 
or maybe you can utilize some email reminders for individuals when it's time for them to increase their tithe or to give to the church. So that's something that I'd love for you to think about as you're in your discussion groups. I want to thank you so much again for inviting me to speak with you. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you in person as Hurricane Marco and Hurricane Laura come towards the Gulf Coast, which is where I am in Galveston, Texas. I felt like it was important to at least make this video for you so that if I do lose power during those storms, I can still have this discussion with you. I want you to feel free to email me with any questions and all of those recipes will also be shared with you. And I've provided these questions that I I've talked about throughout our talk for your for your breakout session so you can come up with wonderful ideas. I'd love to hear what you come up with and some of the great creative ways that you think of to live a more sustainable and zero waste life. Thank you again and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you very much Christina and Jenny. That was very good and uh, very informative. I hope we can all take advantage of some of these ideas. In two weeks, we'll be having an, another talk, this one on regenerative agriculture. Dave, do you want to share your, uh, your information on that? You bet. So uh, we have a guest speaker um, from the uh, University of California Master Gardening Program. Uh, her name is Dr. Sajimus Paskadi. Um, she goes by the nickname Mint. She's a certified master gardener since uh, 2015. Her education background is in ag agroecology, soil well, quality, and um, plant sciences from UC Santa Cruz. Prior to um, residing in Santa Clara, she was an adjunct faculty member at Fresno State, conducting okay. research in areas related to soil uh, fertility, cover crops, and composts. Currently, she works for the Santa Clara Unified School District as a farm educator teaching students about soil, plants, composting, pollinators, and nature. So um, uh, Mint will be um, helping us um, uh, learn more about how our, uh, we can incorporate some more sustainable practices at home and, and uh, help improve soil, soil health and crop yield and, and um, overall help uh, address climate change. Um, Jonathan and I have also um, uh, agreed to add some local flavor and, and uh, share a little bit about what we've, we've been doing in our own yard. Okay, well, as you can see, we've got uh, plans to continue this series every other week uh, out through October 7th, and we're just putting together what's going to come after October 7th. So please stay tuned for that. Um, and thank you, David, for the, that great update. I'm looking forward to that. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I would like you to join me now in a, in a closing prayer. This is a, a blessing in the chaos. I thought it was particularly uh, appropriate for today. To all that is chaotic in you, let there be silence. Let there be a calming of the clamoring, a stilling of the voices that have laid their claim, that have made their home in you, that go with you even to the holy places but will not let you rest, will not let you hear your life with wholeness or the grace that fashioned you. Let what distracts you cease. Let what divides you cease. Let there come an end to what diminishes and demeans and let depart all that keeps you in a cage. Let there be an opening into the quiet that lies beneath the chaos where you find the peace you did not think possible and mm -hmm. see what shimmers within the storm. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much for joining us tonight.